John here from Anatomy Bootcamp. Welcome into another video. In this lesson, we're gonna be taking a look at the cerebellum, which is like the mini brain of the nervous system, at least so that's what people think. But you'll see it actually serves a completely different purpose and it has different functions compared to the rest of the cerebral cortex. And we're gonna be talking about some of those functions in today's video. So without further ado, let's just jump into it. And in this case, we have a 47 year old male patient with a history of hypertension. He's experiencing difficulties walking lately, uh, has a wide base gait with small shuffling steps. When asked to stick his hand out in front of him and touch his nose, so in the uh, finger to nose test, he begins shaking uncontrollably and his, as his finger gets closer to his nose, you order an MRI and this is what you find. So hopefully by the end of this lesson, we're gonna be able to understand what is going on with our patient. So let's start off by describing the location of the cerebellum. And as I said in the beginning, people confuse it for the mini brain because here's our cerebral cortex. Here's that little cerebellum. It looks like the cerebral cortex just shrunken down and it sits just inferior to our cerebral cortex under this region right here. So if you remember this region, well, this is gonna be that transverse fissure which separates the cerebral cortex from that cerebellar cortex. And passing through the transverse fissure, that's where we're gonna have that tentorium cerebelli, which is that dura fold, which extends off of the cranium and sits between the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex. And if we're describing its location in relation to the brainstem, well, it's gonna be sitting just posterior to this brainstem. And if you remember in the brainstem video, we talked about how we have cerebellar peduncles attaching the brainstem to the cerebellum. We're gonna have the superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles coming from the midbrain, pons, and medulla, respectively. And those are what attach the brainstem to the cerebellum, and it creates that fourth ventricle between the two structures. So now let's take a look at the cerebellum from different angles. Starting anteriorly, you can see it has almost this triangular shape, and the similar shape is seen posteriorly, except anteriorly, we're gonna have these cut edges. And if you remember what these are, or you can guess what they are, these are those cerebellar peduncles. We would have that superior, inferior, and middle cerebellar peduncles right there. So that's just a way how you can distinguish whether you're looking at it anteriorly or posteriorly. Also anteriorly, as we're gonna talk about, we're gonna be able to see this lobe in here, this orange lobe, which is the follicular nodular lobe, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Whereas looking at it posteriorly, we're just gonna be able to see our posterior lobe, a little bit of that anterior lobe. And then looking from a superior perspective down, you're gonna see we're gonna have like this crescent shape to it. We're gonna have our two cerebellar hemispheres. So now that we can orient the cerebellar cortex, let's take a look at the lobes. So first up, we're gonna have that anterior lobe, and this is gonna be the most anterior and superior. And it's this small portion right here, this little triangular shaped portion sitting on the very superior aspect of the cerebellum. And our anterior lobe pales in comparison to our posterior lobe, which is gonna be this huge lobe down here. We're gonna have a fissure separating the anterior lobe and then the posterior lobe is so big, it's gonna have a fissure separating the two halves of the posterior lobe as well. So this big green one, this is that posterior lobe. And then finally we get to that follicular nodular lobe, which can be used as a feature on the anterior aspect of the cerebellum, which can help you distinguish it. So that is going to be this orange region in here, right below or inferior to our cerebellar peduncles. And one thing to note, when we see our anterior lobe sitting underneath of our cerebral cortex, as you would find something in situ, sometimes it's very hard to see because it's so small and it's so superior that it tucks in between our two cerebral hemispheres. But nevertheless, you can usually distinguish the fissure separating the anterior and posterior lobe, and you can get a sense of where that anterior lobe is going to be. So now that we've broken down the lobes, let's take a look at some of the features of the cerebellum. Starting off first, the cerebellar hemispheres. So those are going to be on either side and they transcend both the anterior and the posterior lobe. So you can see right here, it's a hemisphere. Here would be another hemisphere. 
and those two cerebellar hemispheres, well, they're going to sit on either side of what is known as the vermis. So the vermis is going to be this midline structure, which again spans both the anterior and the posterior lobe. And when we split the vermis in half and look at a midline structure, you can see it's going to have all these little lobules coming off, which we're going to name. Now, if you remember, I said there was a fissure which is going to sit between the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe, and it can be used as a landmark to understand where the anterior ends and where the posterior begins. Well, that's going to be that primary fissure, as you can see right here. Again, sits between the anterior and that posterior lobe. And then found sitting within our posterior lobe, because it's so big, it has a fissure passing through. Well, that fissure is going to be the horizontal fissure. And that horizontal fissure is going to be found right here. And then finally, we have the posterior lateral fissure right here. And the posterior lateral fissure can be found between that follicular nodular lobe and this structure right here, which is the uvula of the posterior lobe. And we're going to take a look at that in just a second. So again, just to recap, we have that cerebellar hemisphere and the vermis, which are going to be spanning both the anterior and posterior lobes. The vermis is going to be in the midline. The hemispheres are going to be towards the lateral aspects. We're going to have that primary fissure sitting between the anterior and posterior lobe. We're going to have the horizontal fissure sitting within that posterior lobe. And then finally, we're going to have that posterior lateral fissure sitting between the uvula of the posterior lobe and the follicular nodular lobe. Turning our attention inwards and looking at the anterior aspect of the cerebellum, we're going to identify some more features. Starting off first, we're going to have the superior vermis. And the superior vermis, as the name implies, we have the vermis right down the middle. So the superior vermis is going to be that superior aspect of it right here. And if we have a superior vermis, we also have an inferior vermis. And I'm sure you can guess where that is. Well, that's going to be right here. And then on the anterior aspect, I said we have that lobe, which we can use to distinguish whether we're looking at an anterior or a posterior view of the cerebellum. And that's that follicular nodular lobe, which we just talked about. And the follicular nodular lobe is broken up into the folliculus and the nodulus. So we're going to have two folliculi and one nodulus towards the center. So the folliculi are going to be these structures on the lateral aspect, just underneath of those middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles. And then our nodulus, well, that's going to be just on that superior aspect of that inferior vermis, just inferior to those superior cerebellar peduncles. And then lastly, we have our cerebellar tonsils, which are going to be these two large bulges on the inferior aspect of the cerebellum. And these are going to sit just inferior to the folliculus and just lateral to the inferior vermis. And the cerebellar tonsils are a very prominent aspect on the inferior surface of the cerebellum. They sit just superior to this foramen magnum. So if we have an increased intracranial pressure, this is actually going to push the cerebellum down and cause our tonsils to herniate through that foramen magnum. So now we're going to turn our attention inwards and take a look at some of the internal anatomy of the cerebellum. You can see we're looking at a mid-sagittal section right here. We've cut directly down the middle of that vermis. So here would be the superior vermis and out here would be the inferior vermis. And you can see the inside of the cerebellum almost looks like a tree where all these branches are coming off of it. These branches are actually lobules and we're going to be naming some of these lobules. So the best way to learn and identify these individual lobules is to divide our cerebellum into four quadrants. We have quadrant one, two, three, and four. Within quadrant one, this is where we're going to have the lingula, the central lobule, and the colman. In quadrant two, this is where we're going to have the declive and the folium lobule. In quadrant three, we're going to have the tubular lobule and the pyramid lobule. And then in quadrant four, this we're going to have the uvula and the nodulus. So breaking this down even further, here is going to be our lingula. This is going to be the most closest to the wall, which makes up the fourth ventricle. So this is going to be number one lobule. Number two lobule, this is going to be the central lobule right here. And this is going to be just 
after the lingula. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. We have one, two, and three lobules, which are gonna make up our colon. So lobule one, that's the lingula. Lobule two, that's the central lobule. And then three, four, and five, well, those make up the colon. So these are all found within that anterior lobe of the cerebellum. Moving into the posterior lobe of the cerebellum, we're gonna look at quadrant two. So you can see we've divided it into quadrant two, and I'm gonna divide it further. These upper two lobules, one, two, these are gonna be part of the declive. These lower lobules, one, two, three, these are all gonna be part of the folium. Moving into quadrant three and dividing it further, we're gonna have this portion, which is gonna be the tubular lobules, and then this portion down here, which is gonna be the pyramid lobules. And then moving into quadrant four, this we're gonna have our uvula, which is this large portion right here, and our nodulus right here. So you remember the nodulus, that's gonna be part of the flocular nodular lobe. So the lingula, central lobule, colmen, declive, and folium, these are all gonna be part of the superior vermis, the tubular, pyramid, uvula, and nodulus, those are all gonna be part of the inferior vermis. So I know this sounds difficult to name all these and remember the names and which lobule is which, so I have a mnemonic that you guys can use. It's quick, easy, and simple, and it's like cats chasing dogs for the party up north. I know it's random, but it works. Let me show you. So we're gonna have like, which is the lingula, cats, which is central lobule, chasing, which is the colmen, dogs, which is the declive, for folium, the tubular, party, pyramid, up, uvula, and north, nodulus. Like cats chasing dogs for the party up north. All right, so now we're gonna look at some of the functional areas and functional divisions within the cerebellum and talk about what they do. First up, we have the spinocerebellum. And the spinal cerebellum, it's gonna be making up some of the anterior part of the anterior lobe and the entire vermis. So it spans from the superior vermis to the inferior vermis. And what the spinal cerebellum does is it receives proprioceptive information from the body through the spinal cord, so spinal cerebellum. It uses this proprioceptive information to help coordinate movements in relation to where our body is. Next up, we have the cerebellum, which is a large functional area and is taking up pretty much the entire posterior lobe. And that cerebrocerebellum, well, that's going to be involved in fine-tuning motor movements in our limbs and body. So towards the center of the cerebrocerebellum, this is going to be more trunk uh, coordination, whereas towards the outer aspects of that cerebrocerebellum, that's going to be involved in more distal aspects in our body, like our fingers and our toes. And this plays a large part in motor learning and coordination. So for example, if you're trying to do the finger to the nose test where you stick your finger out wide and then you try to bring it in and touch the tip of your nose, that takes a lot of coordination. And if there's damage in this area, you would not be able to make those movements. So the cerebellum allows you to refine these motor movements and finely tune them. So next up, we have the vestibular cerebellum. And as the name suggests, it receives input from the vestibular apparatus, which means that it's going to be involved in balancing somehow. So it's involved in uh, balance vestibular reflexes and eye movements, and it's receiving input through the vestibular apparatus network, as well as visual inputs. And the vestibular cerebellum, well, that is going to be the entire follicular nodular lobe. Great. So now that we've covered these functional areas, let's discuss what happens when these areas are damaged. So like I said, the spinocerebellum is receiving input, proprioceptive input from the rest of our body, which allows us to make coordinated movements based on the positioning of our other limbs in space. So... So damage to this area is going to cause difficulties controlling walking. And this is very apparent when you see a patient with the spinocerebellum damage because they have a wide base gait and they're shuffling their feet. If we have damage to that cerebrocerebellar area, we're going to have impairments in our highly skilled sequences of learned movements. So we're not going to have that refining of our movements before we go to perform them. or It's going to be very uncoordinated. That's why when you see a patient try to do the finger to nose test, as soon as they get to their nose, they're shaking uncontrollably because they can't coordinate that. 
And finally, for our vestibulocerebellar damage, this impairs our ability to stand upright. So this is due to the vestibular component of it. So the patient usually doesn't have appropriate balance to maintain an upright posture, as well as difficulties maintaining direct gaze. And this is involved in the visual pathway. So eyes are, have difficulty maintaining a point of fixation. So now coming back to our 47-year-old male patient, you can see on his MRI, we're gonna have this area right here. So this is a stroke, and this is explained by the hypertension. And if we look at where it's affecting, well, it's kind of along the midline, as well as into that cerebrocerebellar area. So he's gonna have damage to that spinocerebellum, as well as that cerebrocerebellum. And that's gonna explain his inability to walk properly, as well as his lack of coordination for fine motor movements. So because he's walking in small steps and shuffling his feet, that is due to the spinocerebellar damage. And then the cerebrocerebellum involvement, well, that's gonna be explained by his inability to coordinate his finger to his nose during that finger to nose test. And again, our patient experienced a cerebellar hemorrhage in our right cerebellum. When we remember when we're looking at our MRI, this is actually right, this is left, it's a flipped. So long story short, if we have cerebellum damage, this is gonna affect our ability to produce smooth directed movements. So now we're gonna move on to a couple practice problems. And for this question, we have identify fissure A which is right here. And then what two lobes is Fisher B separating? So if you guys want, you can pause and take a crack at it. I'm just gonna answer it. So Fisher A, you can see it's found within this large lobe right here. So this entire section right here, well, this is gonna be that posterior lobe. And if you remember which fissure passes within that posterior lobe, well, that's gonna be that horizontal fissure. So A is the horizontal fissure. And if this is the posterior lobe, and this is the boundary for the posterior lobe, well, B is going to be that primary fissure. And the primary fissure is going to separate the anterior lobe from the posterior lobe. So again, fissure A, that's going to be the horizontal fissure. And fissure B is separating the anterior and posterior lobes. So next up, we have identify structure A. And then what is the functional area that structure A is found in? So again, if you want, pause it right here and answer it. I'm just gonna provide you guys with the answer now. So if here is our posterior lobe, and here's gonna be our brain stem. Coming off that brain stem, we're gonna have that middle cerebellar peduncle. We're also gonna have the inferior cerebellar peduncle. If you remember, we're gonna have a little structure which is gonna sit just under that middle and inferior cerebellar peduncle, which is the folloculus. So this is the flocculus. The nodule would be tucked inside somewhere, but the flocculus or the flocculi, well, those are still visible with the brainstem still attached. So this right here, that's a flocculus. And what functional area is it a part of? Well, that's gonna be that vestibulocerebellar functional area. So again, it's the flocculus and it's part of that vestibulocerebellum. So just to wrap things up, when you're reviewing this on your own, you should be able to identify the lobes and the features of the cerebellum, as well as identify the functional areas which those structures are a part of, and then describe what functional deficit would occur if the cerebellum is damaged. So thank you all for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next lesson.